says swordfish. It's going to be braised in the wine and greenery used by the monks of the Grand Chartreuse Monastery. And I'm all ready to make fish in monk's clothing today on the French Chef. <laughs> The French Chef is made possible by a grant from the Polaroid Corporation. Welcome to the French Chef. I'm Julia Child. We're going to do great big fish steaks from great big fish today. And I thought you'd like to see the great big fish. I'm going to start out with a smaller version of the large halibut. And this, this is a tiny, a 10 pound baby halibut, but they get to be 300 pounds. And it's a relative of the flounder. And it's called in Latin, hippoglossus, hippoglossus, which I suppose means hippopotamus, hippopotamus of the sea. But it's a marvelous fish because it's a really all-purpose fish. It's lean-fleshed and it's got firm texture and you can use it for chowders and braising and everything. It's a, one of our great fishes, so I always wanted to remind you of it. And this fish is a small piece of tuna, and the tuna is enormous. It can go up to 1,000 pounds. And all the white tuna, which we never see in the fish markets, comes, uh, all goes into cans, like the Pacific yellow fin and that Pacific albacore. All we find is the red tuna. And it's this tuna that is used on the Mediterranean for our recipe called a ton en chartreuse, which means that it is done as is done by the monks of Chartreuse, or well, there's a vague reference to it. But the French on the Mediterranean only have red tuna. They do not have swordfish, and this is a large piece of swordfish here. And here's a larger piece of swordfish. And over here we have a picture of a swordfish, in case you've never seen one. There it is. And it has, it's the only one of the billed fishes that has a flat sword. And this is an actual sword from a swordfish. And as you see, it's flat. And it's black on one side and reddish on the other. And they make actual swords out of the sword from the swordfish, which is very nice. And a swordfish averages 150 to 250 50 pounds, and it's on the whole a summer fish, but you can get it all year round. The best prices are in the summer, and the winter prices are fairly high, but they, they come from other, other places than the USA when it isn't summer here. And now, I'm going to cut, a, cut us a steak. Luckily, I took a lesson on how to cut a steak, and I hope it's going to work. I've got this great big knife. And if you cut it right in the right place, and you go through the, there, I think I've hit it, yep. If you go through the cartilaginous part of the vertebrae, you can cut it right through, and you don't have to use a saw. If you and you can see how beautiful it is. Look at this. You can see how fresh this swordfish is. Look at this jelly part that's in its backbone. That shows how wonderfully fresh it is. And then another indication of its freshness is, look, it's a lovely bloom. Here's another picture of how it, that's how it, it, it the flesh is lovely and moist. And it doesn't have a fishy smell. It just has a lovely, fresh, delicious smell. And this, it has a bone that goes from here up to here and for cutting a steak, because you usually cut around this bone and then cut right down. And you also want to take the, take the skin off. Put that back for another day. And the skin is quite tough, so you want to take it off. And by 
cutting it, you just cut around, aiming your knife against the skin rather than against the flesh. And usually your fish man will do this for you, but it's very easy to do yourself, as you can see. I've got, I've got every piece, so I'll have to go around it again. Get the rest of it back here. Now this is a little thicker than I expected it to be. This is about, I should say, four inches thick. I would cut this in half, but it's for the recipe that we're going to do, which is braised swordfish, you would want a steak that was one and a half to two inches thick. And two and a half to three pounds of, of steak will serve six people. And of all fish is very perishable. And when you get it home, you should rush home with it. And you should keep it in ice if you're not going to cook it immediately. And I'm going to get some ice and show you just what to do so you'll remember. And you'll find that if you do keep your fish this way, you're not going to have, you're going to, it's going to keep beautifully. I'll get a dish and put some ice cubes in and then put your, fish in a plastic bag and then put ice all over it. You would have a bigger dish and a little more ice than this. But then stick it in the refrigerator and keep the fish iced and keep renewing the ice. And you find that it will just keep beautifully. So I'm going to dump that out. And I'm going to show you what to do now for this recipe. Say that you have your fish and also another thing I think because to keep it fresh and it deteriorates so fast when it's cold is to if you're not coming right home take a plastic picnic container and put some ice in it and put your fish in it and that will keep it perfectly well. All of these studies have been made by the US Bureau of Fisheries and they found that 30.5 degrees is ideal for keeping fish. And fish doesn't freeze at 30.5. And now here, this would be to freshen your fish before doing the recipe, meaning to give it a little added flavor. I've got too thick a steak. Believe, pretend that this is, that the fish really fits in here a little better. And then put cold water, and for each, each um, quart of cold water, a tablespoon of lemon juice and one and a half teaspoons of salt. And even if the fish is big like this, keep it like that and then keep turning in it. And this should sit for, oh, half an hour to an hour, probably an hour for a great big fat, fat steak like this. And this will, for business particularly if it's an oily fish, this will reduce a little bit of that oil. The swordfish is relatively oily, not as oily as the uh, as tuna. And halibut, on the other hand, is the least oily. And then this, if you're not going to use it right away, you would put it in the refrigerator. And that, you could leave it like that, well, it happens for several hours. And, but the main thing is just to remember to keep the fish cold and that really fresh fish smells fresh and it smells as though it came right out of the sea. And we're now ready to do this recipe, which is called ton, T-H-O-N, which means tuna in French, en chartreuse. And this is a famous Provençal recipe, and it is, it is related to the method that the monks of the Grand Chartreuse used for their own food because they were vegetarians and they just lived upon roots and greens. So anything that was done with roots and greens could be related to the monks of the Grand Chartreuse. This is a rather far off, a rather far off cousinship. But the great chef Carême developed several things called en chartreuse that were tremendously elaborate molded things, but as long as they had lettuce and roots in, it was considered to be the method of the monks of the Grand Chartreuse. 
And what we want are two cups of sliced onions, and then we want one sliced carrot, and that takes care of roots. And the monks of the Grand Chartreuse, this may make you remember them a little more, is the liqueur, this lovely green liqueur Chartreuse that they made. And that probably helped them wash down their humble roots and greens. I don't know whether they were a jolly group or not, but that liqueur is awfully good anyway. So we have one carrot and two cups of sliced onions for the rootery part of the recipe. I'm just making this all neat and nice. And these now are to be cooked first in olive oil. And because this is because this is Provençal, things get cooked in olive oil. And I'm going to put in about a quarter of a cup of olive oil. And be sure when you're getting olive oil that you get a good brand of it, and you probably have to test out several ones yourself and put these in the pan and stir them up. And these are to cook and for about eight to 10 minutes or maybe a little bit longer until they're tender and translucent. And I think they cook best when they're covered. And then while they're cooking, we have the green part of the recipe. And these are presumably the monkish kind of greens that if you were a real re vegetarian, you'd be able to go out and find in the fields. In this case, I'm using some very green Iceberg lettuce. I showed this to somebody, and they, it was so green they didn't believe it was iceberg lettuce. But this is to be cut, cut into chiffonade, which means thin slices. This has all been nicely washed, and it's easier to cut if you leave the head whole. And we're supposed to have six packed cups I did this the other day, and I found that a lettuce head of about this side, which was about, I should say, six inches, made not quite six cups. So I'm going to use also something else to continue on with the monkey way of doing things. I'm going to put these in here. And if you had, if you were growing your own garden and had sorrel, that sour grass, you could use some of that too. I don't have a garden, so I'm going to use a few spinach leaves. In other words, you just think that if you were a vegetarian monk, what nice green things you would pick from the supermarket. And this again, this spinach has been washed and the little stems have been taken off. And that gets chopped and that goes in the bowl too. And then these, when when the onions are tender and translucent, the greens then also go in with them. And so I'm going to pretend that these are now tender and translucent after eight to 10 minutes. In they go. I think this is an amusing recipe because you don't usually cook things with, with lettuce. But you'll see when we get it done, it's going to be beautiful. And what this is supposed to do is to wilt down, and then it's going to be part of the braising ingredients that the fish is going to cook into with wine. And this has got to cook probably 10 to 15 minutes. And I'm just stirring it around a little bit because you want to get it thoroughly covered with the oil and the vegetables, and then it has flavoring that's to go in. And this is going to be garlic. And this time, rather than putting the garlic into a press, I'm going to do another method, which is this smash, mash, chop method. I'm going to have two great big cloves of garlic. This is, you know, I think people are very funny about garlic. I call it the garlic mystique. I suppose it's because it's so strong and delicious. People feel that it has a special quality, so they have very special ways of doing it. And some people don't like a garlic press. 
So they prefer doing this. You put it in a piece of wax paper and then you go wham, wham, like that. And she's practically chopped up when you do it. And in that goes. But having done it in wax paper, it makes it rather easy. And then it's going to have some fennel, about a quarter of a teaspoon of fennel, and about half a teaspoon of oregano. Get used to measuring things in your hands. It's much easier. And about a quarter to a half of a teaspoon of salt. You can always add a little salt later. Fennel. <coughs> Pepper. Fennel has a, a slightly anise taste, and it's a very typical of Provençal cooking, and it gives it a very, very special and, and a really lovely taste. Now, that is to cook with its cover on for about 10 or 15 minutes until it's wilted. And then after it's wilted, it's going to look like this. See that still is nice and green, but the greens have wilted down so that you'll be able to cook with them. And they're now going to go with the fish. Now here we have a fish steak, and this is going to be going to be browned just a little bit. Not really browned, it's just to be what they call sweated or lightly sauteed on each side, just to stiffen it. And again, you want about an eighth of an inch of oil in the pan. I'm going to be doing a, a, a token sweating, as they say, just so that you'll remember it. You put the fish in the pan and then let it cook over moderate heat for about three or four minutes until, until it is just beginning to brown on one side and then turn it over and let it cook just a little bit, two or three or four minutes on the other side. And this, as so often in French cooking, these little extra minutes are something that gives it an added flavor and texture. And your greens have been beautifully flavored so that you don't have to salt the fish, but you can salt it if you want. Actually, I should have salted it and I forgot to. Do. There, and then put some underneath and all around of these vegetables. And see, already that smells lovely. I'm sure that it looks lovely too. I mean, it does, because I can see it. I'm gonna put that somewhere, but I don't know where. There. And now, this is to have some wine in. And you can use white vermouth, which I've used a great deal, because it's often hard to find a good white wine. Or shop around and look at and taste various domestic white wines. And this white wine in a half gallon bottle is so a so-called California Rhine wine, but it turns out to be very good, and you need about a cup of wine in. Or if you're going to use white vermouth, use about two-thirds cup of white vermouth. And you want to be sure that that comes up to the simmer. Now, if you don't happen to like wine, you can use bottled clam juice or fish stock. You, have to, you want to have something that's going to have a good flavor to it, because I mean, it's either, either wine, fish stock, or clam juice. If you have nothing but water, you might just as well not do it, I think. And now, this has to cook covered. If you have a cover for this kind of a casserole, which you usually don't, sometimes you'll have an, uh, one that will. I'm putting some oiled, heavy-duty foil on it. And you want it to let it to come up to the simmer. And then it goes into the oven. And the reason it's very important to have a kind of dish that will come up to the, that you can use both on the stove and in the oven is because you're going to have much more, much more accurate timing if you can bring it to the simmer and then put it in the oven because you start timing from the time that this go gets, what do you call it, gets to the simmer. And this big thick steak is going to take about an hour to an hour and a quarter. And it's supposed to simmer quietly and thoroughly. 
all the time that it's cooking. And now here we have the ready, the one that's been in for an hour to an hour and a quarter. And it's nice and steaming there. And I'm, I think I'm gonna put this on another, another platter because it's gonna be easier. And that oven that that fish was in is a 350 degree oven. I think I forgot to tell you that. But you put that on the platter with, with all the vegetables on top. And then we're going to have a lovely tomato arrangement, which is going to go around it, which is going to be very pretty. As you will see in this, these juices are going to strain out and the tomato, I want to keep all of the, all of this, the roots and greenery, which are going to go back over the fish. And, and that's going to have to be arranged nicely. And this is going to get a, a top decoration and then, now this, these juices are going to be boiled down with some tomato. And this is, this is such a pretty recipe as you're going to see when we finally get it arranged. And the juices, of course, have all of the herbs and the garlic and the other lovely flavorings in it. And you want to let this boil. And this is called a tomato fondue, F-O-N-D-U. And we have two cups of tomato. And this is, as we've done a great number of times, called tomatoes peeled, seeded, and juiced, or tomato pulp. And this is what it looks like. You, know, you peel the tomato and cut it in half, squeeze out the juice, and chop it, and then you have the fresh tomato, and it's much better to use the fresh if you can. The, if you can't use the fresh, you can use part fresh and part can. And you just want to let it cook. See, it's now coming up to the simmer, and by the time you've got the decorations done, this will just have cooked through enough. And when it's done, I have some here that's already done so that we won't have to wait around for it. I'm going to bring that over here. And we have the decoration, which is, I better put on my glasses so I can see how it goes. This is going to be a decoration of anchovies and of black olives. And the anchovies go crisscross all the way down. This is very, very Provençal of doing the anchovy decoration. I tried this dish using red flesh tuna, and I just didn't like it nearly as well as with, as with swordfish. And I think it's too bad for the French that they don't have swordfish. There's some, I, I, I much prefer the tuna raw in the Japanese manner than, than baked. But I never have had the white flesh tuna, which is supposed to be very nice. Or, or at least much better. The <clears throat> I think the red is sometimes rather coarse. But just remember with this that you can use either tuna or swordfish or any great big steak. You could use a big cod, which would be very nice, too. And then we're going to have olives on. I need one more piece of. And then olives in between. You see, we're not, when you're decorating things, I think, always think of the color scheme that you want to produce. And now the tomato goes around. So it really is a fish, a green fish swimming 
in the sea of tomatoes. And the tomato, of course, this tomato has a lovely taste because it is cooked in the in all of the flavors that we put into the fish, the fennel and the other things. Fennel, oregano, and then of course the garlic. There, now, as usual, I think you have to have some little paper towels around to make, you wanna make sure that your platter is clean. Now you can do this somewhat ahead, but I think you wanna be careful about it because you don't want to overcook the fish but when it is a braised fish you have to cook it long enough so it's fairly tender so that when you put your fork in it is reasonably tender i'm going to turn off my take off my fondue so as with this kind of a thing i think don't do it too much ahead it can keep warm but it's going to be much better if it's fresh I'm going to serve it so that you see what it looks like. This is a nice, nice big steak. Now what I like about it is the serving pieces look so attractive and then tomato around. I think not on top of it because you don't want to hide the decoration. I'm going to turn that around so it should get the best view for later on. And with this, you could serve pasta or rice or French bread. I'm serving rice. And French bread is always good, especially if you have made it yourself. And that's how it looks. And with the wine, you don't have to have a fancy wine. You can have, this is uh, just a uh, Rhone wine or a Chablis, or again, you could use a good old domestic dry white wine with a certain amount of body to it. I think that the a Pinot Blanc would be nice. Now, one of the wonderful things about this type of recipe is that we've adapted it from a classical French recipe, but it goes beautifully with any great big firm fish steak. Not a, not a salmon, because that's a very special case, but halibut, bluefish, tuna, big cod. And what a fragrant way to remember the brothers of La Grande Chartres when you do a fish in monk's clothing. That's all for today on The French Chef. This is Julia Child. Bon appétit. <laughs>